Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this dialogue series, the Global Library Readers Show. Uh, we at the Innerly India and South Asia are having this program for the specifically for cohort three members. Given the COVID time, we felt it would be nice to bring the speakers on board virtually and have a dialogue with them, try to understand their experience and have like a walk the talk, um, you know, story. Um, the kind of leadership roles they've played, the kind of changes that they've brought, what sort of uh, community services have happened so far, and mostly, you know, from, you know, from you know, from the from the all the north side or you know the the west side. So we have selected a few um, global library readers, and it is it gives me immense pleasure to have. Um, Mr. Rolf Halpel to join us on this series at the beginning of this year. Uh, we've had so far two speakers and it's gone really well. And uh, Rolf, I would like to have a, I'd like to introduce you very quickly um, by saying that he is an affiliate uh, instructor at the University of Washington High School and he served as a professor of practice under the Distinguished Practitioner in Residence Program 2018-2020. Uh, he, is, he was a director of citizen services and library in Arahus, Denmark from 2006 to 2018. So this is, uh, means that he, he really is bringing you a dearth of information that would be really useful for you to learn from. And also a city librarian from 1994 to 2006. So you can see he has really played a very key role in libraries. He is a librarian by education. He also holds a master's degree in digitization and public administration. So he's a man of many hats and he has served as a librarian, deputy manager, city librarian, director in four Danish cities. Um, he has also been a chairman of numerous steering committees, uh, groups, boards, and he has written many articles. He is actually a renowned uh, speaker on library development and transformation. He has served as an expert in architectural competitions of new city libraries in the capitals of Norway and Finland. And he has worked for four international foundation as an advisor in the library field. Among the rest of his work tasks, he has also headed the Danish Digital Library Coordinating Body, initiating and planning the series of biennial next library conference, which is very popular in, in, in the Denmark side of the world. And, um, he has also put Arahus on the map as one of the innovation hotspots of international librarian leadership, co-heading the development of the design thinking tool for libraries with the commissioner of the Chicago Public Libraries, Brian Bannon, and heading the development and the realization of the main library, which is the Doc One library in Arahus. In fact, if I remember my journey in Doc One, I remember seeing that uh, a lot of innerly innovators from other parts of the world have also contributed to some part of the design of, uh, of how Arahu's library was, you know, architecturally uh, put in place. So, um, you know, it's like a very different example where they built the libraries keeping the librarian's thought process in mind. So you're gonna learn a lot from him. The, the acclaimed library opened in 2015 and it was awarded the best library of the year from the World Library and Information Congress 2016. As you can see, uh, like I said earlier, there's gonna be a dearth of information. It's giving you each one of you an opportunity to actually hear from a stalwart, you know, literally having all kinds of experiences on his hands. So welcome on board, Rolf. It is, um, we're very grateful to have you uh, part of this series. And over to you, looking forward to hearing from you on community engagement and innovative ways in uh, public libraries. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you make Thank me blush. make me blush. Oh, and, and now I'll start the sharing the screen. Um, let's see if I can find the presentation and so this is, there we go. So I'm going to speak a little bit about community engagement, innovation, uh, and so forth in public libraries. And um, as already has been mentioned, I was a, a trained librarian and I've worked as a librarian and, and library director for many years. So today I'm trying to frame the now, the, the current situation, then I'm speaking a little bit about digitization, and then I'll go into community engagement. Then we'll talk a little bit about how we, we may, might create a culture of change. 
and, and find new partners because partnerships are really one of the crucial things for, for libraries to consider now. And we'll talk about the library as a physical space. Uh, you know, the, the COVID uh, situation will, will, will <laughs> is only temporary. So we will need the physical libraries again, in, in my view. And then I'll end up by talking a little bit about uh, possible scenarios for library development. So framing the now, of course, it's very much about COVID right now. And the libraries have been dealing with it in, in very different ways. Uh, all, all over the world. This is a, an incident from US that has also um, informed the world um, and has created a lot of internal fuss in US, but certainly also has had an international impact. Um, the George Floyd killing uh, in US that sort of created a lot of unrest. And uh, the recent uh, happenings in the Congress of US is certainly also um, disturbing the idea of democracy and, and has ripples all over the world uh, right now. So they, they are, there are really a lot of things going on right now uh, in the world. And in some ways, uh, democracy is being challenged. Uh, and, and that is, in my view, a really, really important situation for libraries to make take a stand to uh, to work uh, to work deliberately with democracy so these are some of the um, challenges that libraries have dealt with and there has been a lot of ways of dealing with that the, these uh, are, uh, newspaper clips from uh, us but in all countries uh, mainly because of the covid crisis Libraries have been very innovative and very um, dealing with the situation, um, which is really something that librarians can be proud of, I think. This is a quotation from a Chicago mayor uh, who said, never let a serious crisis go to waste. And there's, there's a kind of truth to, it, to that wording, that when we go into crisis, we become... You know, we fight for our existence and, and we become uh, really innovative and there's this uh, reason for thinking out of the box. So we also need to think about that. And the opportunities that opens up for libraries is uh, at least one of acceleration. One thing that has been very uh, visible in many countries is that uh, the movement towards digitized services in the libraries have been accelerated. Uh, through the uh, throughout the COVID uh, thing, you, 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 as an example, that that goes for all sectors of society. Now we are using this uh, Zoom uh, app to communicate in this very instance, and you know there there has been a boom all over the place for for uh, new ways of connecting um, digitally, but also providing new kinds of digital uh, services, and that's an opportunity for libraries to go in that direction. But the question is, if, are there any other new directions that libraries can uh, undertake? So the first one is going more digital. Now digital has been here for a long time and libraries have developed all kinds of web pages and services. Um, and uh, there are a, a number of services where you can access uh, content from uh, libraries. So the libraries pay for that. In this case, these are examples from US uh, of sort of uh, services that are accessible through libraries. But actually, it is not the libraries that provides the contents. It's vendors, it's, uh, it's um, publishers that, that gives that. But the libraries pay for the access so people can actually access all kinds of digital content. This is an example from the Seattle Public Libraries. I was working two years in Seattle. And uh, the Seattle Public Libraries have really developed a lot of digital services, uh, including uh, digital learning portals and, and services directed to schools and teachers, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a, there's a, there's a backside of this uh, development. So these are apps that are accessible for Danish um, citizens and uh, 
this is the library app. So the fight for attention uh, is really, really intense uh, in that digital realm. And the libraries are all of a sudden from having been a very particular service when we were analog, now we're just one amongst a lot of different um, services in the digital realm. And we need to uh, work in that, uh, in that environment. So one of the areas that is really important for libraries to think about is the digital divide that in most countries, um, a lot of, uh, it's very hard for some in these countries to access even digital services. What you could call the first level of digital divide is actual, actual access, access to the tools and access to the networks. Um, and then there's the skill sets that we, which you could define as the second level of digital divide. A lot of people doesn't, although they might have access, uh, better or, or poor access, they, they struggle to have to get the skills to actually be able to use uh, in, in, a, in a proper way the, the digital services. And then thinking about the outcomes, how do you actually use the possibilities, the opportunities provided by the content of digital services to improve your life. That's, that's another set of skills and, and understanding that a lot of people don't have. And all of these three areas, three areas are areas for the libraries to work in. So the libraries need to join the conversation uh, in our also uh, looking at the online communities that use the libraries and, and really try to be on some of the uh, social media and, and the digital portals and create services and engage with uh, the citizens uh, in the social media, and find their role in that. I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm saying this is where we need to go if we want to still be relevant uh, as, a, as a digital service. Because when a citizen is connected, there's also a strong possibility that she's empowered. So that was, that was sort of what you could call one part of the digital realm. Um, where I come from, we are also thinking about how can we actually automatize our services uh, in the physical library. And this is our self-service return uh, robot in, in the in the library in Aarhus. Uh, it sorts books and puts it down to this sorting machine in, in the lower level uh, where we have uh, uh, the main library and 18 branches. Um, and this, this uh, sorting device is actually sorting a lot um, and uh, is based on an intelligent system. So what we see here is books that are going to one of the 18 branches and the system knows every shelf in every branch and knows if in one branch, maybe gardening books are uh, no longer, I mean, they're lent out. So the system will automatically take out gardening books and put in uh, the box that goes out to that branch library when they're delivered back from any other place. So in, in using that kind of robotization will, has made it possible for us to have floating collections in all the libraries. It increased the diversity in the collection, and we have much less transportation that we used to, saves a lot of time and cost and resources. So it functions like we, we have a black box uh, sort of system where we have a, a, what we call uh, a media hotel, a, a physical uh, space down in the bottom of the Doc one library where the books are stored that we are not having in use at the moment. For instance, in Denmark, Christmas is a big thing. So when Christmas approaches, a little sign will come up to uh, on, on the smartphone of the um, workers, and uh, they ask to go down to the black box, take out uh, shelves number this and that, and throw it into the sorting robot. And then the books around Christmas will be distributed out to the, to the different branches. And then again, when Christmas is over, right now, then the system will automatically take out when books are delivered back, those books will go down uh, into the, the black box. 
And this is, this is very automated and, and works well. We have been doing a little, well, fun experiment around shelving bots, um, which is actually not nothing that we want to uh, put in place, but it's more like uh, a fun device to, to have a prototype. But this one is more serious. It is actually a robot, um, a humanoid robot uh, developed in Japan, but we have uh, translated uh, the language to Danish. So this robot, Norma, she speaks Danish and she's able to communicate with, uh, with you know, kids and, and adults for that matter. And we use her, for instance, for uh, a storytelling lesson for uh, kids from uh, kindergarten. So why do we engage in that robot thing? Well, that is mainly because most of the Danish industrial production has already been robotized and that development is going very fast. That means that there are society issues that we need to have a discussion about. We need to have a dialogue uh, in the population around what is happening through this um, robotization. How, how does that impact society? What about wealth distribution, for instance? So the people who own the factories, they don't have to pay that much in salaries to workers anymore because everything is robotized. So what about that surplus, that value that is generated? Should that just go to that one or th those few persons having stocks in that? Or is that a, a greater society discussion on how to do that? We want to instigate that kind of discussions. But to do so, we need to make sure that people understand what are those robots? How do they function? Uh, where are we now in the development, et cetera? So those are areas that we have engaged in in our society. But one of the most important things are really uh, community engagement. Um, how, how, do we, how do we connect to our community? So the definition or one definition of community engagement is that it is a dynamic rela relational process that facilitates communication, interaction, involvement, and exchange between an organization and a community for a range of social and organizational outcomes. And I like that definition because it's broad and, and libraries are not about lending out books. Libraries are about improving society through the library's uh, activities. So one of the questions that I always like to pose when I discuss uh, matters with other uh, library workers uh, or librarians is to which problem in society is your library the answer? So thinking about those, um, one of the things that we have noticed uh, where I come from is that there has been a really, you could call it an erosion of the civic engagement. So the way that democracy has functioned uh, in Scandinavia and, and uh, also Parts so of Western Europe is very much about informing people, giving them access to information, but they have been alienated to politics uh, to a certain degree and been very passive consumers of democracy, you know, just voting every uh, fourth years and, and so on, which in, in a sense has been eroding the social capital, the coherence in society. And they have always, we, we have been more and more thinking about, you know, democracy, it's up to the government, we, we don't want to engage in that. And it has been more and more, uh, you could say, uh, delivered in the hands of the experts to think about uh, society and society development. development. And we have been, you know, worried and concerned. So what we need to do is to think about involving people more facilitating exchange and sharing, um, fostering civic engagement and active participants. And in that way, try to build some social co coherence. And thinking about problems in our society, not as their problems, but our mutual problems. Thinking of uh, moving those problems and the solution to those problems from the expert domain into the public domain where we all can contribute and thinking um, about um, opportunities in society. So thinking not about so much about problems all the time, but also thinking about opportunities. So where can the libraries play in to where there are opportunities in the local society? 
So in, in the traditional way of uh, community engagement activities, it has been, it has often been a, what you would call a need-based approach where the focus has been on the problems, on the deficiencies, which has in a sense have created a, or can create a client mentality in the communities that are being in, in brackets helped. So outsiders come into a community and help. Um, and the problem is that there's a lot of incentive to think that way. A lot of in institutions, including uh, teaching and research institutions like universities, they are retaining the deficiency model because that's how they get their allowances, their money. That it's a good way if you can define a lot of problems and we have these serious issues in this community, then there's a good chance you get some money to help out. So that would be, uh, you know, research focused and, and so on. But that does not change the communities. That does not make the community self-reliant. Uh, on the other hand, it may, or the risk is that the communities will be dependent on outside help. So there has been a shift in the thinking in the social sciences about this towards a more what we, is known as the asset-based community development. Thinking much more about um, the resources that are already there in the community, how can that be activated? How can uh, a community help itself? Um, so that, that is a much uh, more healthy uh, process, you could say, or approach to community development. So where I come from, uh, we have had citizen engagement formally for a long time, and I've been a civil servant for many years. The ways that this has been played out or orchestrated has been rather dull and duty-driven. It was mandatory that any uh, service or um, Public, public service or public institution should involve citizens, but always through hearings and very formalized uh, ways of engaging. But we have moved forward to, towards a much more um, cooperative way of engaging with the local community, very much relying also on users' inputs and, and ideas. So we are, we are much more co-productive and co-creative now. I'll just show you this model uh, formulated way back by Sherry Arnstein, an American sociologist. She, she had this ladder of uh, uh, citizen uh, engagement where she, in the, in the bottom uh, of, the, of the ladder, it was pure manipulation. Uh, you know, you, you, would, you would make people, you would ask people to begin engaged, but you had already made all the decisions as a civic servant. Maybe it was also a little bit about therapy. People could let out steam and anger, but it wouldn't change anything. So uh, in all fairness, I would say that we, where I was working, we were about informing and uh, a bit of consultation. So we weren't that bad, but we're not, we were not really good either. We always informed what was going to happen, but we seldom really asked what are the needs of this uh, local society. But we have moved up towards a much more involved uh, way of working where we actually delegate power to the local communities and we form partnerships with uh, resources in the communities. So this is a, a, a well-known model, um, the participation spectrum, which goes from the very basic inform on the left-hand side to consult, involve, and collaborate. So in the right-hand side, that is where we want to be. It's hard, but that is what really has the potential of um, improving societies uh, for all of us. So this is an example of an asset-based uh, approach. Uh, this is one of our branch libraries in uh, Aarhus, uh, where we have um, refugees and immigrants, a, a large proportion of those people are living in that area. And uh, here we have, the library have instigated uh, a workshop where uh, people from the area are solving their own problems, uh, designing uh, services or new ways of doing things.
that can actually pro, um, improve their uh, living conditions. So in that way, by involving uh, the citizens using their brain power, their initiative and their ideas, you get a totally different situation. They are not uh, contributors or, or they're, they're contributors, they're not clients. And there are so many assets in almost any community, I would argue. So that, that's a transformative thing. One of the things that a, a library could do is to make a community asset map, find out where are uh, the where are the assets in this community? Where are the people of resources? Where are the institutions uh, that can actually help out? And the, of course, the library is a very important part of that asset map. So here's a few examples from Aarhus, where we uh, are, we are getting out of the library. Here we are in an elderly care home, uh, working uh, with the elderly people in, in trying to find ways to uh, build services that that is that are relevant for them. Here we are uh, also in a community where we're working with local citizens to build uh, a new services uh, areas. Uh, here we are outgoing and and uh, uh, at a um, at a LGBT plus uh, exhibition where also the library has its stands. And we actually also, in our design process, we actually go home to people and ask about their general situation, get an understanding of their general situation and what their needs are before we try to design with the citizens uh, new ways of conducting library services. A library garden meal, ideation uh, in the libraries. So the libraries have moved from what we call outreach when I was a young librarian to a much more co-productive um, approach to the way that we uh, work with communities. So how do we internally create a culture of change? So one of the, one of the things that we have been doing is to make it very obvious that we had to reinvent the library from the traditional book lending um, factory, you could call it. Uh, in the uh, Scandinavian countries, the libraries were great successes in the industrial, um, in the industrial era, where uh, all knowledge was bound to physical entities like books. But now, now knowledge is floating all over the digital realm and, and it's actually very much in the head of people. So it's a different way of thinking about the library. And we have been trying to reinvent the library for a, a period of at least 20, 20 years, I would say. Thinking about new ways of funding. This is uh, our main library when we had um, the European Capital of Culture in Aarhus. See 75,000 people around the library. That That is, that is really uh, something that is... Um, important for libraries to think about how can we become sort of a, a hub of uh, interest for, for people. Is it about money? Not really. Because what we have experienced is that we have actually got relatively seen less money over the years. And what we uh, have experienced is a, a very, really uh, strong permanent crisis, you could say, if, if, if that gives any meaning because we're always fighting inside the public sector for money. And this resource fight is, is very intense. And often um, the cultural sector loses to elderly care, uh, of course, to, to children care, to schools, et cetera. So it's, it's really about getting the most of our money. And to get the most of our money, we need to think about innovation. So what is innovation? Well. On one hand, it's something new and it has value for the users. It must be something that has value for the users. We have been using a model of uh, thinking about um, innovation that is uh, also a relatively old model from Devonport and Prusak way back to 1998, where we think about um, the divergent phase where we uh, 
where we have some knowledge when we are starting a new project, when we are trying to do some development, we think, okay, this is what we know about that problem we are going to solve. And then there's things that we know we don't know. So this is things that we need to research. And then the last part, that is what we'll stumble across when we go into the process. We don't know that we don't know this, but we, it, it's something that we need to know and we'll find out during the process. And then we have the convergent phase where we formulate goals and aims and vision fulfillment, action plans. And that's part, that part is what librarians are normally very good at. They're very good at setting up plans and so on. They are not necessarily very good at pursuing ideas and developing ideas and just, you know, trying to go a little bit further, thinking a little bit more out of the box. But that can be trained. In the middle, you have the grown zone when you do a project. Maybe you remember from your work uh, or from when you were studying or when you're doing a project, that's always a part of the time where you are really frustrated and you, know, you think we will never get beyond that point. We will never make this work and so on. So that's perfectly normal. And when you talk about it with, in project groups and so on and understand that this is a way of thinking, then it's much easier to you know, overcome uh, room and, and, uh, and misbelief. So... Looking at the divergent phase, small innovation, if you have a very short divergent phase, you don't follow out our ideas, you don't build new ideas, but just go with the first idea. Um, then you'll probably have a small innovation. It will not be a big thing. Contrary to what people believe, the first ideas are seldom the best. You have to work with the ideas. Then if you, on top of that, have a very long convergent phase, the time to market phase, where you plan and maybe use too much time to bring it up to the people, then, then you're almost guaranteed to fail. On the other hand, if you have a, well, long and broad divergent phase where you bring out ideas and, and give yourself um, the opportunities to explore new ideas and so on, and then have a very short convergent phase, the time to market face, then you have a good chance of making real uh, innovation. So some of the formats that we have been using is creating meetings with um, stakeholders, or users in the libraries, uh, creating workshops where we, for instance, do idea pitching with uh, members of uh, the community. In this case, it's user-driven design. It, we were working to uh, do a prototype of a new deliverance model for kinder books in a local area. And we have people from the local area helping us in that prototyping. We use focus groups where we uh, interview representatives. Uh, we have idea workshops where we work in this format. It's the World Cafe format where we bring down ideas and somebody is uh, drawing on the wall, uh, creating visions uh, for the future, uh, and in various ways working uh, with the community. In this case, it's phototyping. This was from our old library where we had staff and, and uh, representatives from the community taking photos of the old library and uh, discussing what should stay back and what should move uh, with it, with us to a new uh, library. Willis Square, the lead users where we work with the young people from uh, university. We actually hired them on a six hours per week contract. So we, in that way, we were able to use their networks or rather they work with our librarians and we had outgoing programs uh, to schools and out in the cityscapes and, and so on. Um, so we call them mind spotters and uh, the librarians were mind keepers. And you see that little caravan was part of the brand of uh, that mind spot project. Yes, some of the, the kids we work with. But in general, we work with participatory design where um, we try to engage uh, users also in testing of uh, any, new, um, any new service that we try to provide. Here we are building the future library with the kids uh, that work with us over summer and a prototype in the library. While they were building in cardboard uh, a prototype of the library, they were commenting 
uh, and they were documented. You might see here on the uh, left uh, bottom part uh, the guy who is video filming, and that that became part of the architectural competition for the new main library. Uh, the, these inputs from the kids because they would be main users. Here we are. This girl, she was um, she was asking for bird singing in the library, and and in the beginning we didn't know what, what to do with that. But eventually, we installed two soundscapes in the libraries that can emulate, uh, for instance, um, bird singing or music or whatever. We have been working in our branch libraries in the Grow Your Library project, where young people from the community are encouraged to work and transform. The library was situated in a, in a very small park. They transformed that to a garden where they grow things and they create meetings and so on. So in that sense, we have delivered that park back to uh, the citizens uh, in order to, to have them take responsibility for what is going on in there. And there's a lot of meetings and stuff going on in that garden. So one of the most important things that uh, we could do, we, we, we use this model to think about what we call the mashup library. So a mashup is when you create, for instance, a digital service. Uh, you often mash it up. That means that you have you put in services that are actually run and maintained by others than yourself. So in a web page, you can mash in the TV program or the weather forecast or something like that, and that's maintained by somebody else. So we took that idea and brought it back to the physical library. So now we have a physical library that has a lot of services that is not necessarily run by the library. It's curated by the library. It's us who decide who can actually do something in the library, but it is done by partners that we have identified. And as long as that goes along with our mission and our vision for the libraries, that is perfect because that makes it possible for us to create a lot of new services. It gives us new resources and skills and a lot of uh, inspiration from others, increased network, etc. So that I think has been the most transformative um, activity we have ever done. That is forming those partnerships and having th that activity go on in the library because the users of the libraries, they see everything as a library services, a library service that is going on in the library. So these are just a few examples of the uh, partnerships that we have in the uh, Doc One library and our branch libraries, they have their own partners in their local communities. So we have now more than 130 partnerships going on. And that means that we can create so many activities. This is the program for one random week. We have 42 activities that are mostly done in partnerships. So that has totally transformed the way that libraries are functioning. I'll just use a few words about the library as a physical space. I, I believe it's very important that the library has a social infrastructure, that the library is, um, is a physical space to go to. And um, a couple of years ago, the, the book of Eric Kleinberg came, Palaces for the People, uh, which is about the social infrastructure, how parks and open public spaces like libraries can be the difference between literally literally life and death. Uh, he has some examples from the uh, heath wave that was in Chicago, uh, and, and it turned out that people died um, in numbers in areas where there were not those um, uh, public services, like, for instance, libraries and, and so on, uh, available. So this is actually extremely important. What we have been working on, where I come from, is that how do we rethink library spaces from being places where we can find that information that can be found anywhere to think about what can only be experienced in the library. Looking not as the library as a space for media, but looking at the spaces in the library as media. It's not so much about what is online, it's what happens on site. Information and data in itself is not that interesting. The interesting thing is to put that information into context, to give it meaning and significance for those people who live in the local community. 
it's not so much about facts, it's much more about trust and credibility. And libraries are trusted in the general public. It's not so much about meeting information, it's about meeting people. It's about experimenting. It's about looking at the visitor as a resource, not somebody who comes and uses your resources, but somebody who has something to contribute. The libraries have never been neutral. That's, that's a popular misunderstanding. Libraries have always been about values, certain values. Democracy is one of them. Uh, freedom of expression, etc. Those values are what libraries are about. So having a sense of humor and be open for things that can happen is also good. So this is how it looks in Duck One. This is actually a wheelchair ramp you see before you, uh, where the wheelchairs can go up and and by creating that in the new building, that wheelchair ramp, that totally altered our own perception of how can we use this space. So the architects, they wanted to put shells on the plateaus that are formed. Um, but uh, we, we gave ourselves the, the challenge to say, no, this is too good a space just for having bookshelves. How can we actually activate this? And this is the same space. Here we have a public uh, presentation. Here we have a children's literature festival. This is a, a, a drone flying club event uh, where we have uh, the drone flying club in Aarhus demonstrating drone flying and what you may and may not do, etc. and flying the drones in the library. This is the knitting club. These are, um, in this case, women that knits and they, they have just formed this informal club. These, the furniture can be moved around. So this is just an ordinary day in the library and the club has self-organized and used the library for their knitting activities. This is a seminar for startups, all in the same place as you've seen. Um, here it's an election meeting for the uh, public elections. So having those uh, social and communal spaces so what we see here are uh, young guys engaging in conversation. So that's a social space. And you see down there in the left side, it's also social. People are engaging with each other. On the other hand, over here, you have what you could call a communal space. That is where you don't have to engage with the other people, but you see them. You see the otherness of others. And that is so important also um, in societies that are being more and more living, more and more in bubbles, you need to see other walks of life, other people who might not be quite as you or living the same, same way as you, but they are also human beings. They also have aspirations, etc. So they are not a threat to you. They're part of the community. So having that, those opportunities for bridging and, and bonding in the library is extremely important. This is from uh, our families and children's area. So we don't have a children's library. We have a library for families and children. We like to keep them together. Here we have a choir singing. And here uh, it's the opposite side. Uh, we have something going on on the floor and, and where the choir was standing, uh, somebody is now sitting. There are lectures going on in the library. And of course there's a cafe uh, where you can um, but uh, there are also the dwelling points. They're the oases where you can dwell and, and contemplate and be uh, looking inside and reading and, and contemplation. Study areas. That was the cafe. And the, the pram parking. That is also a social space. So we, we uh, organized a, a place for uh, people where they can park their prams. Because, and, and we had actually organized that in another place in the library but people wouldn't let go because the area for the toddlers is just to the left of this. And they need their prairie wagon with them where they have all the supplies for the kids. So, so we had to organize this and that has been a tremendous success. And here you see people, you know, uh, socializing. Our tweens lab uh, where we can make, you know, chemistry and stuff and, and take out the bad uh, air, uh, air from those things. Uh, a dark room where we have coding activities for kids and the make the making spaces the maker spaces and of course in Denmark we will have to have Lego uh, that's almost mandatory 
And here we have a kid who is reading and driving at the same time, which is not recommendable. This is our, these are pictures from our playground outside of the library, which is called the globe. Uh, what you have here is on the top left corner is the Chinese dragon and then the Russian bear and then the African savanna. Uh, down left corner is the American eagle and behind it is the Icelandic uh, volcano, all for play and, and physical uh, exercise. So the digital components in the physical space is very much screens and we have an interactive floor we developed way back uh, with a little... Um, with the Aarhus University, and that eventually became a new service. Here we have the old uh, arcade games, and and you know people, elderly, well, parents tell their kids on how they did when they were young. This is a recommendation from uh, one of the librarians, and so we have all these digital services around in the library where we can recommend and and uh, so on. Interactive screens, uh, very. Uh, easy to use uh, interactive tables where we can make pop-up um, uh, exhibitions. In this case, uh, it was when David Bowie died. Uh, we could very easily make an exhibition and on the interactive screen, there's a lot of uh, information and music and what have you. This is uh, also a service that we developed with private company uh, where we have book front pages where we can, you can press the, the screen and get additional information. So. The movement from space for media to space for people. I like this quotation because there's so much truth to it in, in my view. Libraries are low intensive meeting places and creators of social capital and trust. Very important to think about that. Low intensive meeting places. So a few future scenarios. One of the th roles that I see has developed to a certain degree in, in, in US is that libraries are becoming a little bit about community archives, but activist archives, where um, the thread is that a lot of voices of society are not heard. And we are now also uh, witnessing that a lot of publica publications are actually written by artificial intelligence. And we know that the underserved communities are growing uh, in the US very much. And um, the recorded memory is very biased. And these voices are not heard. So the libraries could be places where those voices would be heard and would be documented uh, in a collaborative um, effort. Also, the idea of having the library be a kind of democracy hub a democracy lab. I mean, it's very much needed that democracy is certainly under pressure. So how do we actually develop democracy and, and democracy um, activities uh, in the local communities? The libraries, again, can play a very important role in that. So um, one thing that is also very obvious in US is that the libraries are often becoming uh, first responses, uh, responders to all kinds of um, social uh, issues, social challenges, which is very demanding for the libraries. There's a lot of homelessness, um, uh, you know, a lot of poor people, and it doesn't seem there's, a, there's also been a deprivation of the middle classes, uh, particularly in U.S., and that means that people uh, with no assets, people experiencing homelessness, will often go to the library. The problem for the library is that they have never been uh, funded in a way that they, they can actually uh, keep that to, to do something sensible with this. They don't have the staff that has the education to actually work as social workers. So the libraries need to think about how do we actually cope in that situation? Can we make partnerships with social services in a way that we don't have to use our spares uh, resources to do social work because that will kill most libraries. So, but the, on the other hand, it's very important to, to keep the idea of the library as a safe place for everyone, that everyone can come in uh, and use the library for free. And then there's the idea of the library as an innovation hub, the library as a place where people actually 
ideate, come up with new ideas, work together, uh, and so on. So that is also one of the things that I uh, personally find very important in, um, in the libraries. I, th I think that has become increasingly uh, important is also the privacy uh, in the digital realm. Uh, we are being um, surveyed, uh, we are being uh, overlooked, uh, artificial intelligence is coming stronger than we think, um, and we are being uh, exploited by a lot of social platforms uh, right now. So I'm, f I'm, I'm almost uh, aggressively followed by ads when I've tried to buy something on the uh, internet, uh, the next month or so, I'll be, I'll be bombed with ads uh, on Facebook and other uh, social services uh, on that theme, which is, how do they know that? Yes, we are all sub sub uh, we are all part of that. Um, and we could have library librarians work as privacy activists, the ones that think about this. One of the greatest um, challenges we have right now is the misinformation that goes on in the social media, uh, the conspiracy um, issues and so on. So I think it's very important for the libraries to, to think about what can our role be in combating uh, misinformation. And then the last thing uh, is, well, the library has a creative meaning in, in life. Uh, we all need, you know, uh, some contemplation, uh, some quietness, uh, maybe mindfulness, ways of getting off of uh, the fast pace of society. And the libraries still have that function. It's a place where you can go and dwell and maybe engage in some cultural activity. Um, and the librarian, one of the great successes we have had in uh, Doug One was uh, when uh, some of our librarians started to do storytelling. Just, you know, put up a chair, set up a, a number of chairs in that, you saw that um, wheelchair ramp kind of thing. So we would put out chairs there and one of the librarians would at a certain time, which was announced in our social media profile, um, start reading from a book. And that has been <laughs> tremendously popular, which was a kind of a surprise for us. So there are so many ways that the library can also pursue that kind of scenario. Oh. oh, what happened here? I'll just get rid of that. Yeah, I think that was the conclusion of what I wanted to say. So thank you very much for your patience so far. There we go. Thank you so much, Rolf. Uh, I just felt like I went into a library movie. <laughs> and uh, I think one of the biggest uh, takeaway, I mean, uh, it, it's always when you're in it, the picture is very different when you see it from outside. Today, I found that um, public libraries is, is like a multi-dimensional being. It has, um, it has plethora of opportunities for librarians to see it beyond the box that it already exists in. And uh, I would like to also just add a little bit because I've seen the Doc One Library. A lot of the photos that um, Rolf shared today, there are many spaces which have been reused for different purposes so there are some spaces that may seem like oh my god they have so much of space but actually they've reused a lot of the space and they also have an amazing bell um, for every child that is born in um, it's, it's Arahus, I think uh, Rolf can add there is a bell the moment a child is born because I think uh, they like to recognize the and celebrate the birth of a newborn in their um, city. So they have amazing ways in which they keep connected with the community. So thank you so much, Rolf. It was, um, it actually was much more mind blowing than what I had seen uh, the doc library for myself. So it was uh, very useful, very informative. But I think let's quickly move on to the next part of the session, which is going to be a 30 minute um, it's going to be like a cafe conversation. We have uh, a very, um, you know, many of you know her. Her name is Preeta. She's been here with us for the Inali program to support us in all the leadership capability training. So she's come here on board 
and uh, a quick introduction to her. She has more than uh, 17 to 18 years of experience in the corporate in the capacity of HR business partner. She's also a learning and development specialist. She plays a very strategic role as a head of HR. She's a gold medalist from um, in MSW from Madras University, and she has an MS in communication studies from Ohio University, USA. She has worked across uh, different industry internationally. Preeta is also very multifaceted. She also, whenever she gets a time, she dances. she's into theater, she's into arts, she's into films. And she also engages in a lot of social um, impact based projects whenever possible. And one such is for Inali India and South Asia. Um, besides that, she also had has an edge over uh, creative design thinking, content, and, uh, you know, making things more purposeful and meaningful. Like Rolf just now said, you know, in anything, it's about trying to redefine it for that space. So she also has that in her. She plays a very critical role as a facilitator, as a coach, and can be compared to like a catalyst in expanding and transforming people and people's lives and communities. So welcome on board, um, Preeta. It's over to you. Um, we're looking forward to this uh, conversation uh, with Rolf. Thank you so much. Pleasure. And, and um, th thank you, Wolf, Rolf, for um, sharing um, that fantastic, uh, what would I say, gold mine of wisdom and information and experience uh, that uh, you have had with all of us very generously. You know, not all leaders um, are generous and not all speakers are fantastic in articulating uh, you know, their learning. So thank you so much for that. Um, my first question to you is like this. Um, things were very different before last year. And come March 2020, COVID hit and shook the entire world. And, uh, you know, the, the post-COVID has made us believe that the digital medium is fantastic and has made us all look at that like never before. So my question to you, Rolf, is, uh, and of course, today's program is a testimony of that, that statement, you know, the, the power of the digital. So I see that you have experience uh, heading the Danish Digital Library. And as a leader, how did you drive innovation and change? Because at least in India, in this part of the world, I can say that um, there is a lot of resistance to change, though people are slowly warming up to it, especially in the space of digitiz uh, digitization. So how did you influence people initially? I'm sure in your part of the world, it's a lot more mature. So how did you influence people, especially the hard nuts to crack? And if you can give a compelling example of having done this successfully in terms of driving innovation, driving digitization, and driving this kind of change from a people aspect. Well, um, uh, in, in, in our developing of the Danish Digital Library, for instance, we worked a lot. Um, uh, it, it was actually a bottom-up uh, effort. So it actually started way back in 2008. There were people working in my technical um, department. They were thinking very much about open source. So be, because we were paying money to all kinds of uh, uh, developers uh, and, and, and service providers, and these people working in our technical de department, they said, why don't we go for a much more open source approach? And they worked together with uh, another Danish library entity uh, uh, in Copenhagen. And they came to me and to my fellow um, leader in Copenhagen. And they said, hey, listen, we want to do this project that we called, uh, that, that we called Thing, uh, where we will try to develop service and a service platform built entirely in open source software. And I, I was kind of oh, hesitant towards that, but of course they had a good idea and why didn't we, we tried to get a project going on that and, and they got some, we, we, we asked for external foundations to supply some money for that. And we started that project and eventually that led to the formation of the Danish Digital Library, which is a platform, a digital platform built entirely in open source. And that meant that we could go to, for instance, the ebook providers and say, hey, 
we would like to buy some ebooks from you or the, the right to lend out ebooks uh, from you, and we will pay good money for it. But it has to fit into our digital platform that we have built in open source, or else we won't buy it. And we had, you know, a lot of struggle. This is not free of conflict. But that meant that eventually the Danish, uh, we have developed a lot of services in that digital platform, all done in open source. So the way that we now work with that is we go out to a public tender and say, okay, we, we want to develop this and that uh, app or whatever, and we will pay really good money for that. So who wants to supply that? It has to be built in open source and, 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 uh, and accepting all the rules of open source so anyone else can take it and build on top of that. And the, the, uh, the providers, they are happy about that model. That what that has meant is that we are 98 communities, uh, 98 municipalities in Denmark. And normally when we would develop an, an, an app, we would go out and ask a private company to do that app as one municipality. And then the developer could sell that app to the next municipality and the next and the next and the next 98 times. But now when we have organized the, the Danish digital library, we work together in the 98 municipalities. So we have one development of that app and we can share it. That also means that we run in the same infrastructure. So the website of Aarhus public libraries and the website of Copenhagen uh, public libraries and any other municipality in Denmark, they might have a different skin. They might have a different uh, you know, content, but it's the same backbone it, it runs on, and we can share the content. So when a librarian in Copenhagen has made an exhibition about uh, the Trump uh, thing, and here's the books and so on, we can take it, any of the other 98 municipalities can take that exhibition of front, book front pages, et cetera, digital content, and mash up into their own uh, website. So in that sense, we have, you know, magnified the reach of the libraries uh, tremendously in the digital realm. And, and we have lowered the costs tremendously as well. That has been, I would say, one of the, one of the biggest, uh, you know, developments that we have done. And it's a huge breakthrough because I haven't um, heard, even in the corporate world, of so much of... Um, um, you know, convergence between, um, you know, bodies, like, for instance, most people or most uh, bodies work in silos, and the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and vice versa, right? Uh, this is a true case of uh, convergence of two big bo bodies, and how, um, how beautifully you work uh, together in sync. Uh, but there might have been challenges, Rolf, uh, could you speak about any particular challenge in the process of this happening or were there no challenges? Oh, there, there were plenty of challenges. Um, one of the challenges uh, is certainly towards the publishers, the, the content owners of, uh, for instance, the ebooks and so on. So we have had, uh, you know, so many fights with them. In the beginning, they wouldn't uh, let us, um, uh, you know, uh, they wouldn't provide uh, certain content to us because they wanted to exploit the private market for, first. At, in Denmark, there's a library legislation saying that, you, you know, we, we have a right in the libraries to buy all the physical books that are, for instance, all the analog books. So libraries can buy any book and we have to pay something for it, but also the state of Denmark pays the right owners, the, the, the authors of the books for having them present in the library. And... Um, Transforming that to a digital realm, that has been, you know, a long and hard fight. Uh, but now uh, the publishers has also understood that the libraries are actually, um, when, when we lend out or give access to digital content, uh, they actually also sell more. Uh, and that discussion has been going on for, you know, 100 years in, in also in Denmark and other countries, that when the libraries would provide free books to, um, to the audience, would that mean that, that the, they would not buy books? 
all evidence shows that the people who actually borrows books in the libraries also are more prone to buy a book. And that, that discussion has also transformed into the uh, digital realm. I can't, I can't say that it's conclusive that people who also use digital content uh, would also be most susceptible to, to actually buying it. Uh, that, that's not conclusive yet, but I would suspect that that could be an argument. Anyways, we have, we have uh, had now a relatively good um, understanding with the publisher, but that was one of the challenges we had. We also had a lot of technical uh, issues in the beginning uh, that they, they have been solved as technical mm. issues always will be. So that, that was actually not a big deal. Okay. Thank you so much, Rolf, for uh, answering that question in the most succinct manner as possible. Um, I see that you have um, co-headed the Design Thinking Toolkit for Libraries along with the Chicago Public Library, right? And you were co-partnering and co-heading that. Now, design thinking is a word, a, 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 a methodology or a philosophy or whatever you would like to call it, which has cut through different industry across the world. And like never before in the last two, three years, design thinking word has been used very loosely everywhere, right? It's more like a fad now. Um, I heard you use words like convergence and divergence, prototyping, which are very typical design thinker words. Um, I'm a certified design thinker and I, I work, I consult for industry uh, as a design thinker. So uh, I know about what exactly you're speaking. But it's one thing, you know, um, applying design thinking in a manufacturing setup, especially a product driven uh, industry. And it's a totally different thing when you apply design thinking in a service industry, especially in the library spaces. Uh, it's very, very, very different. You know, the, the tone of the whole thing. So it would be really great if you could um, throw a little bit of light about how did this whole partnership germinate, progress? I'm more interested in knowing about the challenges that you face because you are from a different con continent and you are working from people from a different continent. How did the, uh, the divergent thinking and the convergent thinking happen? Um, and what were some of the highlights of the um, design thinking itself being applied uh, in the library space? And how did this whole toolkit emerge? So I'm uh, very interested to know if you can share that uh, with us. It'll be great. Because some, some of our library innovators are in early folks. Uh, are very keen to know about design thinking and actually apply it in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because um, to me, design thinking was uh, already a mindset before we knew anything about uh, design thinking. It was very much about how do we engage with the local community? How could we together create something? And we learned uh, some methodologies in that area um, one was prototyping, another all the different ways that you can create ideation processes and so on and so forth. But it was not sort of in a, in a coherent way that we worked with it. Um, but eventually, uh, I'll stop my video. I, I dropped out, I can see. Uh, but eventually, uh, no, no, when, we, when, we, when we work with... Um, uh, Chicago Public Libraries, uh, we got more into uh, coherent thinking about it. And then when I went to um, Seattle and uh, sort of had time to get deeper into the backgrounds of design thinking and the ways that uh, design thinking uh, can be applied and, and what is actually the rationale behind it, then I understood a lot of, of what I, we have been doing in Aarhus. Uh, for the first time, you could say, uh, which was a really enlightening um, experience for me. So for me, um, we, for instance, one of the ways that I think uh, we, could, we have been able to use that is actually in the, also before you start a design thinking process, it is how do you activate um, your staff? How does staff uh, become active uh, and, and ID? bringing forth ideas uh, for new ways of service and so on. So to me, um, it's about leadership. It's about opening up the opportunities for staff to bring forward ideas and to 
have make opportunities to facilitate ways that staff can engage in development projects. So the way we have done it, uh, and that has developed over a big number of years, is that every spring we start a process up where we ask out into the organization, do you have any ideas for new projects? Anything that could be, you know, work, um, flow improvements or new services or whatever. And then people have some time to bring up ideas. They only have to write half a page about the idea so we get the notion of the idea. And then we create idea pitching sessions. So um, pitching ideas is, so the one who owns the idea comes to forward to the leadership and says, okay, so this is my idea. We were thinking about this and that and so on. And then we have made an organization where we can actually support um, the idea owner in a way. So we can, you know, set up a budget uh, for that and so on. And we, um, we create, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we ask out outside of the library for funding. So we help the idea uh, created to, to actually formulate um, uh, re re um, um, uh, what's it called, um, uh, letters of, uh, you know, support uh, from other institutions and organizations that can uh, help uh, either by in-kind or by direct money. And um, in that way, we have uh, activated the, most of the organizations to bring forward ideas. We are very open to new ideas. And just to create that culture mm. has meant a lot. Mm. And then we can go into the actual mm. design process where it's about ideation, it's about empathy, it's about understanding um, the community that is actually working, that is going to use this service and bringing in that community's voice and, and testing out and creating prototypes and what have you. So... I can yeah. see that you used empathy as a first step to actually, even when you spoke about what your staff uh, felt, your brainstorming from the staff, and also, uh, you know, the touch points who are in touch with the end customer who's, uh, who are all actually experiencing the library space. Fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, sharing uh, your nuggets of wisdom in that space. My third question to you is something which is directly going to impact the performance of our uh, in Nelly innovators and leaders. I see in, from your you know, tra career trajectory that you've had an accelerated growth and you've, had, you've been in decision-making positions. Um, I also heard you quote about the struggle about getting funding, the, the, the tug of war between the private and the public sector. And, and today uh, in this group, we have a whole lot of uh, library heads and uh, you know, very senior library folks who struggle to deal with the government for funding. You know, there is a lot of authority issues uh, that we face. So how did competencies, and I also remember you um, speaking about, don't look at the problem, look at the opportunities. So for you as a leader, um, how did competencies like creative problem solving, influencing without authority and influencing authority when you do not have authority, enable you to build the right leadership brand for yourself? I know it's a little twisted. There are multiple parts to this question, yeah. but take your time. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I follow you. Um, so normally uh, a library leader in Denmark is not top of the pops. I mean, libraries are popular, but they are not, they are not regarded as uh, very influential uh, and so on. No, that's so the case in India also. Yeah, I That's would suspect that. I would suspect yeah, similar. that. Similar. But what I've noticed is that if you, I think there's a lot about, this is also about a certain personality. It's also about, you know, do you have the courage to approach people who might be higher in the hierarchy than you? Um, I, I have found that most people, no matter what position they have in society, are actually very willing to help, um, for instance, libraries, because libraries have this non-threatening um, uh, image. Libraries, they are not a threat to you. They won't, you know, they won't get you off uh, in any way. And using that, 
mild branch uh, or brand of the libraries and then asking people for help. Maybe just, you know, can we have a conversation about the opportunities that we might provide to your organization? It's one of the ways that we have been working. So we would make what we call disturbance, disturbance calls. So I would grab the phone. I would call somebody we had identified in our asset map in our community that could be interesting for us to partner up with. So I would call the head of that organization and say, hey, we are going, we have this uh, marvelous uh, thing, uh, this new library that is coming up. Uh, we would like to have a discussion with you on how can we help you reach your goals, uh, maybe by giving you space in the library to, for a period of time to present whatever and so on. And we have had- Very smart. No, nobody said no. Everybody wanted to have a cup of coffee and have a little talk about that. Then uh, in some cases, for some reason or another, that was not possible to create a kind of service on top of that. But in most cases, we actually succeeded in having them. Th this is the partnership model that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So that they would certainly, you know, be interested mm -hmm. in, yeah, they could see the idea of us working together and, and they could be exposed to the great public that we bring into the library. So we have some strong assets mm -hmm. in the library. So mm -hmm. uh, eventually we, we, we have four or 5,000 uh, visitors a day in Doug One. And, you know, almost all organizations would be interested in just being exposed to that kind of public. And so anyway, there are many ways, but most people are actually quite nice. And, you know, no matter what rank they have in society, if you just approach them in this non-threatening way and, mm. you know, that's a very smart answer. And I think, um, you know, uh, I, I, I got key words like being courageous, trying to look at not just to win win all the time, but also, you know, the win for the other party involved, um, non threatening. So you're talking a lot about collaborative leadership and courageous leadership. And I think that's very critical in um, leadership brand building. That's what people remember you for. Right. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have just two more questions and then we will throw open the floor or for the others, for our Inelli innovators to uh, ask you questions as well. Could you share a compelling example? So some of the leadership competencies that we have um, identified for some of our uh, Inelli leaders are accountability and decision-making, right? So could you share a compelling example of accountability and decision-making that you have exhibited in your career as a leader or you have seen uh, as a leader other people exhibiting around you that you think would be a huge learning for this group. And accountability and decision making could be coming from, you know, some of the most unassuming or unthought of uh, corners as well. So, Sure. Yeah. So um, accountability, I think, um, I think it's, it's, for instance, uh, when we have had cutbacks in, in our libraries. Uh, so in periods where, uh, tax is uh, going down or there's, um, you know, economic uh, distress, for instance, uh, just after the economic crisis um, hit uh, in 2008 and those years, um, there were cutbacks in municipality. And uh, one of the things that I think is really important as a leader is to be honest about uh, the cutbacks, be honest about, well, we have to, um, we have to cut down um, because of lack of economy. And for me, that communication, um, that task of communicating that uh, is extremely important and to be totally transparent about that and also be transparent on what your actions will be uh, towards that. And to me, I was very sort of honest to say, okay, we have to cut down. Um, we will also cut down uh, in areas of uh, staff because we have to, but we will try the best of our ability to keep everyone on board. So there will be every, every year people are leaving the organization to go elsewhere or retire, etc. So we'll try to um, 
to keep that within so we won't have to lay out uh, lay off a lot of people and and that also the price for that was that we would also move around people in the organization because to keep people we also have to move them around and like I made, redeploy is it yeah redeploy and we I made agreements with the representatives from the, for the labor unions around this and and when I make agreements, I keep them. And, and that, I think that kind, of, um, that kind of transparency is really important for a leader also to, and, and then try to, of course, make the best for the staff uh, involved, get the best situation you can, um, but also understanding that the organization is not created because of the staff. It's, it's for the community. So that will have to be the overall thing. But that kind of communication is important. I think. Hmm. Any hard decisions that you had to make, uh, especially during COVID? Now, COVID was uh, when I've been, been in the uh, University of Washington. So there I was a professor and teacher. So uh, the, hard, the hard thing for me was, can I get out of US? Uh, and back to my family when everything was locked down. <laughs> Luckily, I succeeded. <laughs> okay. okay. That's a good one. All right. My last question to you is um, the context here is that the Innerly Innovators are going to uh, get weaned out of uh, the support very slowly from uh, MSSR. Uh, Priyanka and her team they're going to be in the fringes they're going to move into the fringes not be in the core and let the innovators take over and move forward this movement from here so having worked with global network um, what according to you are imperative leadership competencies that the innerly leaders will need to thrive in a global network to, to build their network to take this whole uh, movement forward as a group so what is your two cents for them in terms of leadership competencies that they need to develop, hone, um, and exhibit? Yeah, so that, that, that's, that's a hard, that is the hardest question that you have posed so far. Um, but I would say that, of course, an op openness of mind, open mind is always great. Um, to, to be receptive for ideas from elsewhere. Um, I know that, I have had hardly had one singular idea myself. All ideas come from other people, either staff or colleagues or other places in society and so on. So it's much more about having an open mind and don't think that you have to cook up all the ideas. Uh, and then I would uh, encourage to, as I said, these disturbance calls that I was referring to uh, is actually also something I, I've used in you know, use the LinkedIn uh, platform to connect to uh, people, uh, you know, write a little thing about yourself and, and what your ideas and, and uh, uh, ambitions are, and then try to connect to someone who are in the library world. Uh, make that kind of thing. Now we have these tools, we have the digital uh, opportunities to actually uh, engage. And then, when we get past this COVID thing, if possible, try to um, also get out of your own country and see things in the real physical world. Um, that is also, it's, it's a luxury, I know, but if you can, then it's certainly something that, that is worthwhile. I was in uh, Thailand, in Bangkok, uh, couple, three years, four years ago, uh, and I saw fantastic, uh, interesting libraries there, uh, which was a big surprise to me. Um, but man, uh, th those were interesting. So there, there are a lot of places also in the proximity that, that can provide that kind of insight. And me, in, a, in a great country like India, of course, you have a lot of places also to go and, and engage with each other. Thank you so much. Um, that was an um, eye-opener and uh, I think much needed uh, set of things that we had to hear um, from an 
external person you know it just reinforced some of the things we have been trying to drive here uh, here i I'm, i'm sure priyanka will agree with me um so thank you so much for your time i'm going to now uh, hand it over to priyanka who will throw the uh, space open the floor open for the, the other uh, our inly uh, innovators and leaders to ask you questions over to you priyanka Yeah, thank you so much, Preeta. Thank you so much, Rolf. That was a fantastic uh, conversation. I know there's been a lot of talking for Rolf, but um, actually, uh, you're making us to dive deeper into our thinking process. I think that's uh, a lot for us to really take back and uh, reflect on how we can see libraries more as an open space rather than seeing it just as a box. You know, it's really looking at it from a very different perspective whether it's a mindful space or whether it's going to be a very interactive space or whether it's being really used to you know chisel out those ideas for community development so there are different ways in which a librarian can actually spearhead the entire institution it's just how they want to see it so with that let us um, just quickly open the floor for our innovators to ask um, a couple of more questions um there are a few which is there on the chat box um i think uh, one very simple question is what are the opening hours of danish library from varuni in sri lanka well right now there are no opening hours because uh, the libraries are closed because of the covid thing um so but normally it it would be from in dog one we have we had open from 8 morning to 10 evening uh but the two first hours from 8 to 10 was without librarians so it was self service and then from um 7 uh, pm to 10 pm uh it was uh, also self service but it's open and and there's a you know you can use all the services because you have self service checkout and so on and that that has become a really big thing in denmark the self service thing in libraries so even very small branch libraries have open uh you know 10 12 hours a day because it's mainly self service then there might be a librarian you know a couple of hours uh, every other day but most of the time it's totally self service so people would log in using their library card or their their id um thing and then there will be you know kiosks where they can check out the books and so on video surveyed uh premises and so on So we have long opening hours normally, and that will come back when once um, you know we are through the vaccination thing, uh, and so on. But I see uh, questions here that are quite interesting. To so, uh, how to reach, for instance, the underprivileged community yeah. uh, in the COVID situation? Yeah. I think that's a that's a, that's a tremendous yeah. challenge. I mean, it is a yeah. tremendous challenge, and I don't have the answers um, to that uh, because I think it. How, how do you do that i think that's something to contemplate for, for you um but i also see a question about the blind and disabled people um in denmark uh, what are we doing for the blind and disabled people um in the library context we have a a, a national library for the blind uh and people who have uh, reading disabilities it's called nota and it uh, provides all kinds of uh, help and and services uh, to people who are blind of course we also have the services um, in the in the ordinary public libraries but the really big um thing is uh, that nota library um yeah so i think um, anybody else uh, you can actually unmute your mic and ask your questions directly ask. I see a question here do you have any services for transgenders and i would say that we are not as far in that development as i have seen libraries in usb 
Uh, I've seen services, I've seen libraries in the US being uh, specifically having specific uh, service for transgender people. Uh, of course, in Denmark, we have uh, books and, and, and content that uh, relates uh, to transgender uh, issues and challenges. Um, but I do not know, and we do, you know, exhibitions and so on, um, but that will be temporary. Um, I don't know of uh, a very sort of specific uh, service in for a service for transgender, but I'm quite sure that it will come um, because I see that development all over the place. Um, this um, new, uh, historically, very new interest for um, the injustices that has happened towards, for instance, transgender and LGBT communities. So, um, yeah. So there's another question from Myanmar, Kia. Uh, using AI in terms of innovative library services is truly inspiring. However, it's a bit difficult to set up in a developing country like Myanmar. Do you have any suggestions for integrating AI in library service in less developed countries? Well, I think that I, I, I can see the challenge. I can see the challenge, certainly. On the other hand, there's also the opportunity for frog leaping. Uh, some of the development steps that we have done uh, in countries that has had more privilege um, and then maybe go directly towards some services. I've seen some examples also in IFLA uh, uh, where you, you could say digital opportunities have been used uh, very intelligently um, in countries that were not that well off as for instance, the Scandinavian or US or uh, some things like that. Uh, I remember seeing, and that was not I, A, uh, I, AI, but that was, um, I remember a project from actually Bangladesh, uh, I think where uh, boats would sail around on the rivers and use sails for um, projecting images and doing training sessions uh, using uh, digital equipment and uh, satellite uh, connectivity uh, to internet and so on. That was really, that's many years ago, but that was really a, a smart way of using technology that at least I could never have thought of. So I think that that has to be, you know, ideation processes in the local uh, areas that might come up with ideas to how can we actually do that? Um, one, one of the things that inspired me very much years ago was I met this um, Greek a librarian and his wife, they were both librarian and they were working on a small island. And when they came to the island, they were supposed to overtake the library and there were holes in the roof and, and the windows was, they were broken and rats was, were running on the floor and the books were just put up on tables and so on. Everything was a mess. And what they did was they walked the village, the little town they were landed in, knocked the doors and ask people for help. Ask people to come Sunday and help out with rebuilding of that library. And you know, we are the new library uh, couple here. We want to create a great place for you and your kids and so on. Could you, could you spare a couple of hours and help us doing this? And people were extremely receptive of that. And they, they in that way, engaging the community to improve their situation and create actually a very good library. That is what we have to rely on in, in also in the local communities. That is that kind of engagement. And that, that demands something from the librarians that they have to go out and touch the local community, talk to people, be there, engage, knock the doors. I know it's very difficult and impossible right now in the COVID situation, but after the COVID situation, it's possible. And, and, and I think it's very necessary. I hope that answers. Um... Oh, uh, yeah, Rolf, I want to ask you that you have a whole, whole bunch of activities that you're off back to, a lot of them in the same space. So, uh, I mean, do you have an, a monthly calendar, or maybe a fortnightly? How do you inform your uh, members about that? So, how pre-planned are your events? 
and for that matter just like a knitting workshop you talked about so how often is it is it weekly is it monthly just a little like so there there are different types of events so there are the ones that we plan and we actually make a half year plan for and we we print that so there's a a, a thick book come out a couple of times a, a year that actually has a lot of uh, of uh, you know events and, and programs and so on and then there's the programs that comes up when someone talks to us and comes with forward with an idea it can be a partner or somebody that we don't know and they come forward and say we have this idea to do this and that and we say okay this is this sounds good so we'll put it in our digital program so we all always have the social media programs so we have a week weekly program as well so that can be altered all the time and changed uh, and so on and so forth mm-hmm. so so we are very sort of open to that but of course there's a lot of coordination to do that so what we did was to create an internal department that we called uh, citizen engagement and 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 partnerships citizen engagement and partnership so in that department the head of that department is the main coordinator of our programming she's the one who sort of makes sure that 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 as things if somebody comes with a suggestion can it be put into our program does it meet the requirements that we have is it within our mission and do we have a time for it and a, and a, and a physical space in the library so that coordination happens in, in that department thank you so much in fact they also have in arahus um, you have a passport services for citizens isn't it there's a separate space dedicated yes. for the cust for the you know for the citizens so it was yeah. very interesting how one space just dedicated and there was people actually getting their passports issued yeah that's right that's right and that was that was a strategic decision that we made way back in 2004 5 at that time there was a lot of talk in denmark about creating a one stop service for generally for for public services uh, like passports and social security and 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 all that kind of thing because they all these services had each their own office physical office so if when when people move for instance to Aarhus to get their new doctor they had to go to one office to get their their social security number they had to go to another office to get their passport they would have to go to a third office and all that kind of thing so we could see that was stupid we need to to create one stop shop for all that kind of thing and that became the citizen services what i could see at that time was that the citizen services they didn't have any physical place it was a new entity but we had 18 libraries scattered all over the municipality so why not use the libraries for those why why not use the libraries when they were already there we already had the infrastructure so i i i convinced the politicians to to sort of make citizen services part of the library services so i was head of the citizen services and libraries in the city of aarhus and then eventually a lot of other municipalities in denmark took up the idea and and put in that kind of service into the libraries there so the public libraries are places where you go to get your passport for instance or social security thing and so on and the reason why that was a good idea was that the libraries have always been about information and service and this new entity was not so much about being a strict uh, upholder of law and order it was much more about a service it was much more about ha- helping people to actually do these things on the internet and the libraries have always been about training and lifelong learning and so on so what we actually do is also we teach people how to actually obtain the public services the egov services uh in in the internet so we do a lot of t- teaching sessions uh, also for people and that's combined with the libraries and the citizen services so we work together in that sense um the next question is is digital consortium policy there if so can you please explain uh is maybe Tama- is that related to the digital library in denmark uh, um 
because well, we, we we do have uh, you could say that the policy in, in in Denmark now is that we the Danish digital library uh, is also a consortium of all municipalities in that sense we buy content together so that the policy is to get most of the taxpayers money um, so um, so that's the idea behind that consortium of the Danish digital library um, the other uh, Ali um, from Bangladesh, technology can be used from public libraries to get more budget from government, international funding authority. Yeah, so this is about advocacy, I would say, um, and there, there, I mean, a lot of ways of um, of conducting advocacy. I've mentioned a couple of them, just trying to approach uh, people in 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 power position and so on, that's kind of primitive, but it, it often works. Um, to make sure that politicians understand that the libraries play an important role in the local community for the coherence of the community. So the libraries, to, to develop that argumentation, that, that advocacy, that the libraries play an important role in the local uh, community. And that can be done by providing hard evidence like accounting visits and, and and so on and that will show that people go to the library okay and also counting you know uh, the number of uh, participants in programs and the programs that you do and so on what, one of the things I always did was um, I would whenever we had a new program and when we made printed materials or also digital um, adver advertising I would send those things to the politician, to the local politician, so they could see that we were active and, and we have done this and that and, and so on. So never miss an opportunity. Um, so that's an interesting question here I also see. Uh, what types of documents get the priority for digitization, especially in your library? So in Denmark, we have, uh, we have national plans for that. So that, this is not something that the individual library does. We don't digitize. We did that in the beginning, and we, to a certain degree, we also digitize. You know, very local, uh, local produced uh, content. But uh, in general, uh, digitization is done by the National Library in Denmark, um, which has a branch in Aarhus and, and one in Copenhagen. So, um, and uh, so, the, the the little digitization we do of content is. Um, very local, very local. So I need a set of uh, some three points of the clarification. Can I? Yes, Roja. Yeah. So the now the first one is already is I uh, just you know continuation of the uh, Preetas or uh, the questions. So first level is the competency level. At what level of the competency uh, were the libraries in the recruitment process? Because uh, you see a different kind of the you know the need based uh, need is identified from the communities walking and uh, getting the informations and through uh, FGD based so these kind of the informations they are doing when they are identifying the needs from the community so that what kind of the competency level you are expecting during the you know, recruitment process of the libraries this is number one and the next one is the, the decision making authority so you said in in a typical uh, situations for example for the uh, the pandemic period you said is some libraries serving the space could be served for homeless so in that situations at what level they are taking the uh, decisions to have these such kind of the services so it could be uh, because we have uh, so many policy level in our country so that it's a centralized one. Otherwise, it depends on the, uh, you know, the so situations. The library can take a decision and what kind of the decision making level in the library level, or uh, librarians level. And the final one is, you said is an outcome. This is a fantastic one. It could be, uh, what is the change in the community? So what kind of the monitoring system, the monitoring mechanisms to find out the, what the change in the community. So these kind of three level, I need to get the clarification from you. Oh. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, I heard everything. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, 
I'm so sorry. Okay, so shall I go one one by one? Rojan, it was a very long question. Yeah, yeah. I can, yeah, I can go up. one. Uh, yeah, the first one is the recruitment level. I said is the library have to some set of uh, competitive level, no? But, uh, so that that skill. What's the skill you are expecting? Yeah, yeah, in the uh, yeah, in the recruitment level. Okay, so. Are you, are you talking about the competence uh, competence level of internal librarians? Uh, how competent they are, or or what what kind of education we are talking about? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's education as well as the skill, the leadership skill. So you have something have oh, in the top. Okay. Yeah, leadership, leadership skills. Uh, so. Um, I could start with myself. I have a I have an MLIS and a and a master in digitization and and the public governance. Uh, in Denmark, uh, library leaders are I would say it's a mixture of people who have an MLIS um, education and there are also about I would say half almost now that comes with other academic backgrounds. Uh, but it's always an academic uh, background. You you will have what equals a master. Um, degree in some area it could be uh, history or or you know language or whatever uh, for librarians it's uh, MLIS or we also occupy a lot of um, other um, backgrounds so uh, we have uh, journalists we have teachers uh, etc uh, so we have a mixture in the libraries that is very different from for instance US uh, where you have to have an MLIS in order to have a career really uh, in the public libraries or in the research libraries. Well, we have a much more open uh, profile, uh, profiling in the libraries. We have a lot of uh, IT people also who, are, who come with all kinds of uh, backgrounds. So we are much more interested in uh, what you could say, what, what do we need to fill this um, gap? Uh, then is it an MLIS necessarily? No, it doesn't have to be. Could be something else, so that that's that's about the competencies uh, that I would say that we have, and that's very. There's also one thing that that I've noticed in, for instance, the American libraries. So every um, person who works in a, in a public library in in the U.S. they have a very strict uh, description, job description. This is what we you are supposed to do. And that also creates a kind of a boundary, a kind of a delineation of people. So they are not supposed to step outside of those borders. While in Denmark, we have a more loose uh, way of defining, of course, we have a job description, but it's kind of open. So if it turns out that you're good at this and that, then we will try to make use of that capability, for instance. We have a janitor down at uh, Doug One who has been the one who has serviced our, you know, we have water cooling. So the water from the harbor goes into the cooling system of, uh, of the library and also into the heating system in the winter time. And so we take out the, the cool in the summer and the heat in the winter to use in our, and he has been doing these, um, this maintenance of that, but he's also a great storyteller. So. This janitor, he, he conducts these programs where people can get with him behind the scenes in the library and see where the uh, seawater comes into the library and he can pull out the filter and show the fish that was caught in the filter today and talk about that kind of thing. So he runs that program. I mean, he's not a librarian, he was just a janitor, but he has that talent. So we make use of that talent. So in that sense, um, I think it's a cultural Thing to exploit all the competences of the staff that you hire. I'm sorry, I don't know if I hit it or got totally wrong, but but um, that was my best shot. Yeah, I think uh, that's what Roja was asking. Uh, Roja, do you have another question? Yeah, and the second one is the decision making. So the second one, okay, we have identified the needs from the community. The second one, the delivery of services. So who will take the authority decision making these kind of these all the priorities and these kind of the you know, services can be delivered to the uh, libraries. So who will take the decision? Who, who sorry, who? Who, who takes the, the library? Decision? What is the level of the librarian's decision making? 
authority. Decision making. Ah, decision making. So, uh, so for instance, a branch library, every branch library makes their own decisions on who do they want to partner up with and, and uh, where, who do they want to work with and so on and so forth. Um, they build their own programs and so on, but we coordinate it in, in the main uh, organization where, where we have this entity that I mentioned, um, the partnership and, and uh, community engagement department. So um, local librarians also, they do not decide, for instance, which books to buy. We have, we, we buy books together with other entities in, in outside of our municipality. So we have a consortium that buys all the books. So, but what the librarians do in the local uh, library, they set up a profile for that library and say, in our community, this is what this community looks like. These are the needs that has been uh, uh, expressed in this community. Uh, and there's a great interest for this and that topic and so on. So we will have so and so many books within that topic and so and so many books within that topic. And then that profile is set up. And that's the profile we use for this, um, this sorting machine and also our buying profile. So we combine these profiles and then we have a little negotiation team in the consortium that then buys this content and make sure that we have we can maintain that profile of, of that local library. So I would say that uh, there is a, a quite a deal of self-determination in, um, in each branch library. Uh, so I need, uh, I just, it's, not, I, it's beyond the books. For example, is, uh, it's emergency, we have to give the space for the community. So at that level, so they can't find time to discuss with the consortium. So in that, so see, the library can take a decision. To, to, to make space for emergency stuff and so on. Uh, nah, we don't have emergencies in Denmark of that nature, which is this extremely privileged uh, area that we live in. We don't have the big floods or the great, um, hurricanes or something like we see in US uh, where the libraries are being first responders for, for that. So uh, when, when uh, I can't think of a, an example uh, where we in Denmark have had to really sort of uh, use the libraries in a real emergency situation. I can't think of that, but I've seen a lot of examples of, of that in US where um, the local library has opened the doors because of flooding or, you know, something else, uh, firestorms, the big firestorms in California, for instance. Um, so somebody must have been taking some decisions there uh, that would be, you know, emergency decisions. Uh, the final one was, uh, you said is outcome. We have to uh, you know, document and showcase what is the change in the community through the library services. So what kind of the mechanic, uh, me you know, monetary mechanisms uh, are followed in your country? What kind of? And, uh, yeah, monitoring system. The, these monitoring kind of, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have, we, we do have um, a part of the Ministry of Culture in Denmark uh, have an entity that uh, overlooks the libraries and they collect all kinds of statistics. So from our, uh, library automation system, uh, all the data there is uh, put into uh, a, a common system. So we can extract all kinds of uh, data on, on a number of levels on uh, loans and number of uh, people visiting the libraries, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of uh, data. I think our biggest challenge has actually been to make use of those, of those data in a sensible way, because we have so much data. and. To my big surprise, when I uh, started working as head of also the citizen service, I found that the other municipal entities didn't have data nearly, nearly as well or as structured as we had in the libraries. Of course, we are also librarians, so we should be able to, 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 to collect data. But what shocked me was that, for instance, when we decided to form the um, citizen service, 
we went out to all the different municipal uh, services and asked how many people comes into your office every day. And a lot of them, they had no clue. They had not counted. They never counted how many people came in. We had been counting that for 20 years in the libraries. So, uh, so that was the, um, so I think we have a lot of data and we are getting better and better at also analyzing the data and, and using it for uh, forward planning. Of course, we have the big numbers uh, of, of, of users and so on. So we can see, for instance, that the book lending gradually have gone down over years and we know exactly which of our digital services has gone up and how much and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of monitoring going on. Uh, the data could be you know, registered uh, in the centralized one. The, all the librarians have to no, no, input given the data by the librarians. Most, most of the data is uh -huh. actually automatically generated. So we have door counters uh, that automatically okay. generate. And, and a couple of times a year, we have a control count. So we put down a student or somebody who counts who comes into the door, and then we measure the door counter and see, uh, is it the same number or is there some devi de okay. deviance or anything like that? Um, the same with the book lendings and use of, because of uh, the digital uh, content, it's so easy to measure all kinds of things. So nowadays, uh, it's, not a, it's not a heavy burden on the librarians to, to count anymore. That, that all happens more or less uh, automatically. Uh, it's it's good uh, actually. Uh, the all kind of the resources what they are using it's okay, but the, the services you said is you know, storytelling is the robo is you now telling the stories to the community. So through the services, what is the impact of the target group? So that uh, the result, how we are tapping that through the uh, so documentation, otherwise how we are uh, getting the information through follow up with the community. And who is going to do it? Yeah, so uh, of course we have, we have uh, social media profiles for all libraries and uh, some of the librarians are very active on, on uh, the social media. And uh, you know, that we, we publish everything and, and have uh, also communication with the local communities and so on. I would, I would say that can be improved. We can be better at it, but, but it is certainly something that we seek to uh, improve and uh, and we know that we have to be out there in uh, in the digital media uh, which preferably the social media and um, well we do our best and try to also uh, we show we try to show a lot of our programming uh, pictures and so you saw my presentation so we we are very much about you know showing something it, it, it often works much better also to decision makers if they can see a picture, especially if they are sell themselves oh. in the picture. But, but that kind of uh, documentation is actually, the storytelling is much more efficient than all the numbers. We need the numbers to make ourselves credible, but we actually have to tell the story to really convince people. Um, and that that is uh, that is also one of the one of the things that I think is extremely important for library leaders to be able to tell the story about that library in a, in a compelling way. And pictures helps. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions from other innovators? Some of you have not asked. Uh, many of you have. Are there any of you who still want to? Do you have any last few questions? If it's not, then um, can we all have our videos on? We'll go in for a quick uh, photo before we actually close down for today. <laughs>